Well, good morning, everyone. Wow, unprompted. Good, good, good. Hey, if you're new with us, my name is Mark Lohman, and I'm the associate pastor here at New Life Community Church. And hopefully by now, you probably get the point that uh, today is not necessarily a normal day in the church, but it's Palm Sunday, which, as Juno said, is the start of Holy Week. Uh, when I was little growing up, I always thought, I, I thought Palm Sunday was like every other Sunday here in Southern California, uh, because every Sunday there were palm trees outside, and okay, this is Palm Sunday, <laughs> but uh, no, Palm Sunday is unique, right? It's the start of Holy Week, and really what it is, is that it celebrates, it, we remember Jesus as he, he's, he enters into the famous, well-known city of Jerusalem, and as he goes in there, they think that it is time, and they were right, um, for power, for triumph, for victory. And so that's why we had the kids come in here waving the, the palm tree branches. And what those stood for in that culture, they stood for triumph and victory. And as they would wave them and as they would lay them down on the, the ground that Jesus would ride over, they would shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. And as Juno said, it means come save us. And it's kind of with a plea, like, save us now. <laughs> we don't want to wait anymore. So that's Palm Sunday. But here's what you have to know about Palm Sunday for the Christian tradition. Jesus did not come as the king that they expected. And that's kind of where things begin to turn. Jesus' so-called triumphant entry was actually kind of a mockery is not the right word, but it kind of was a mockery how kings would usually enter a conquered city. Because back then, the way they would do it is that you would come galloping up on a horse, not my little pony or some little baby donkey. And so Jesus coming in on a baby donkey was actually a pretty subversive message in and of itself. Things were different. It was kind of actually comical. And so Jesus was coming to rule and coming to save and coming to bring power, of course, but not by using the cultural methods of his day. He was actually going to gain power by losing power. And so this is chiefly displayed on the cross. And so Jesus rides into Jerusalem and his mind, his heart, everyone else may not know it, but it's on the cross and he was actually going to win by being defeated. So, big deal. Here's what I'm saying. Not expected. Not only was it not expected, it was actually crazy. It was stupid. And it was scandalous. So, as we enter into our passage this morning, we've been in the uh, series going through 1 Corinthians, which is a letter written to a church in Corinth. And we intentionally skipped part of chapter 1 about a month and a half ago, so that we could save it just for this morning, for Palm Sunday. And so we're going to go back into that and look at it. And then just as a heads up, next Sunday for Easter, we're actually going to fast forward to chapter 15 uh, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But here's what I want you to do this morning. I need you to use your imagination. Here's what I want you to do. In your brain, I want you to think of images and pictures here. And here's the picture I want you to imagine. Think of everywhere that you see a cross. Now, today's culture, right, we have crosses everywhere, and this is why I'm asking this. So it could mean that you're thinking of clothes that you own, jewelry that you have that has a cross on it. If you're cool and hip and you decided to get a tattoo and it has a cross on it, think of your tattoo. Right? Think of all the church buildings, whether on the outside or in the inside, that have a cross on them or in them. Now, with that in mind, replace the picture of the cross with a gas chamber or an electric chair. If you don't know what an electric chair, it looks like that. And if you don't know what a gas chamber looks like, it looks like that. No one's laughing. <laughs> now, now imagine wearing a shirt with a gas chamber on it. Maybe you got your earrings, little crosses on them. Instead, you're wearing electric chairs. You got that tattoo 
Imagine you got a gas chamber right there on your bicep. Furthermore, we have this big cross here now. What if that was a giant electric chair? So, the way you're feeling, the thoughts you probably have, the reaction you probably have, know this. That was the exact reaction to the message of the cross in the first century. So, with that kind of image painted in your mind, let's open up to 1 Corinthians, as I said. We're going to be in chapter 1. If you're new to us, if you're still checking out this Jesus guy, we have free Bibles for you that look like this underneath the chairs in front of you. I will be reading from them on page 793, but feel free to use your iPhone. Uh, we'll have it on the TV screens behind me. Here we go. So Paul planted this church, right? He, uh, he writes these words to that community. Verse 18, chapter 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness. And that's a fun word there in Greek. We'll get back to it. So the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, and he quotes here an Old Testament verse, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Okay, let's stop there. Uh, no doubt, probably, if you're here, at least if you're like me, you read this, and it's like, what the heck is going on? Paul uses a lot of, like, fancy language. It's confusing. What really is his argument? All I hear are the words like wisdom, power, foolishness. What's going on here, Paul? Let's, let's speak in English. This is why I had you think of the image of a gas chamber or an electric chair. Because, like I said, that really is like the emotional reaction that they have to the message of the cross. For them, in this culture, in Corinth, which is like a modern-day Las Vegas or an L.A. or New York City, the cross is foolishness. Now, who here has ever called someone a moron? See, all, all the young people back there raise their hands. At least they're honest. I think we all have. Uh, that's what the word foolishness means. It's actually the, the Greek root, root word here is the word moron. So the cross, they're saying, is moronic. It's madness, it's stupid, it's crazy, and it's foolish. So... Paul says, verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now there's another group, and we'll get to them. They say, well, you say the cross is foolishness. Okay, sure, yeah. But to us, it's actually offensive. It's a stumbling block. And it's just offensive. I mean, that's honestly the best word that I can think of for here. Scandalous would be another word. So we're so used to, in America, 21st century, we wear the cross like, as a fashion symbol, right? It's cool, it's hip, it's popular. I don't know, may maybe it makes you feel warm inside. Um, we, honestly, we don't get the scandal of it. It, it just doesn't make sense to us because we're so used to it. And so maybe even hearing these words, you're like, why do they react so strongly to the cross? Like, isn't this like a pure, holy symbol? So, so why are they saying this, right? What are these groups up to? What's going through their mind? Well, here's what's going through their mind. Verse 22, Paul, he's going to divide all of humanity into one of two camps. Okay? So he says, verse 22, he says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. 
That is the whole backdrop for this passage. You're only going to get it if, if you get this. Here's what's going on. Greeks, that is uh, the culture at large in that society. Everyone who's like not a religious person. Think of it as, I you know, we use the word secular, right? That would be the Greeks. The second group is the Jewish people. Think of them as the religious people of the day, right? The church, if you will. And so Paul is saying, hey, look, everyone falls into one of these two people. You're either a Greek with culture at large or you're a church person. Here's what you have to know about the first group, the Greek people. In that culture, they almost like worshipped, they, they valued speech. Eloquent rhetoric, sounding persuasive, wisdom, philosophy. Like they loved it. It was everything to them. So the best way I can put this is, um, you know, what, what movie stars and athletes are today, right, celebrities, that's what a philosopher was back then. Or, or we would use maybe the word orator. Someone who, who spoke publicly and talked about wisdom and speech and they, they tried to sign fancy. That was who you wanted to be in that culture. Uh, another example, all the women here will like this. Um, do you ever get highly annoyed when your husband listens to sports talk radio and it's just like a bunch of rambling dudes who just talk on and on and it probably seems like the most vain, empty thing and you just want them to shut up and you want to hit the radio button to switch it? Uh, okay, maybe I'm the only one that has a wife that thinks that. <laughs> I think other people have that. Anyway, so that annoying like rambling on for sports talk radio, which I absolutely love, uh, <laughs> If that annoyed you, that's exactly what was popular in the first century within this world. People just loved just to speculate, just to talk abstractly, to sound smart. That was respected. And so it wasn't so much about the, the intellect, how smart you were, as more so as it was like, who are you? I mean, it was kind of more about like social standing. Because... If you could talk smartly, what did that mean? It meant you were educated, which meant you were upper class, which meant you were a somebody. So really, and here's the point finally, this whole idea of wisdom in that culture, it was really a matter of showing off, impressing someone, using your superiority. It was all about image and status. You could show someone how much fame you deserve, how much honor you deserve, and how much glory you should have. And so sometimes Paul here in this passage, yeah, he gets a bad rap for like being anti-intellectual. You know that if you're a Christian, you enter the faith and you have to like dump your brain off, right? I think sometimes people read this passage that way saying, you know, the cross is stupid, it's not smart. No, no, th that's not what Paul is getting at. I can firmly tell you, of course, this is my personal opinion, but, you know, Christianity actually, I think, makes the most sense to believe in. Like, there are actually good reasons to believe in Jesus, and I think Paul would say the exact same thing. So, in this culture, with all that background now, do you think it was cool and hip and persuasive and fancy to talk about a supposed God who became a human and then allowed the government to nail him on a cross. Was that eloquent, persuasive? No. It was moronic. It was stupid. It was madness. So that's the Greeks. Now, the religious people, the Jewish people, Jesus and his followers, they, they were Jewish, right? Christianity um, owes its origin to the Jewish faith. What's their deal? Paul says this, Jews demand signs, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block. Here's the second cool word in this passage. Stumbling block, Greek for the word scandalon, 
which is where we get the word scandalous. Now, r- literally, what this, mer- what this word means is if you trip over something. Like if something's in your way and you fall over, hence why most translations call it stumbling block. For the Jewish people, they were expecting a Messiah, a coming king, who would come in with powerful signs and would kill off all their enemies at that time, Rome, and bring in national victory and power. So for them, Messiah, which just means meant a, a coming king, they associated with that word power, triumph, victory, splendor. Crucifixion meant defeat, humiliation, game over. So when you combine those two words, <laughs> crucified Messiah, I mean, that was like a living contradiction in the world. Um, one scholar said it'd be like saying fried ice. Another example would be a, a square circle. Maybe in our culture it would mean uh, it would be something like saying the Dodgers won. Ooh, angel fans over here? Yeah, come on. That's God's team, right? Angels, it's it's biblical. (laughs) Preaching in baseball, that's where it's at. So, uh, during Roman times, the crucifixion, it was like the ultimate, like, slap in the face. It meant game over, you're done, and we're actually going to show everybody that we won. It was reserved for rebels and for slaves, And so if you wanted to humiliate someone, you put them on a cross. So it wasn't just Jesus that was crucified. It was actually, unfortunately, very common. So to the Jew, the message of a crucified Messiah was absolutely scandalous. And even more so, because in their ancient scriptures, uh, Deuteronomy 21.3, don't worry about turning there, it says this. Because anyone who's hung on a tree, a cross being made out of wood, and so it would be like being hung on a tree, is under God's curse. Needless to say, no desire, no need for the cross in their mind. It represented weakness, and it definitely didn't fall in line with their expectations of power and victory and triumph. So pretty fascinating to me. Uh, You have non-religious people and you have religious people. And guess what? The cross is foolishness to both. This rule of Paul has a little fun here. He says, actually, let let me kind of kick things up a notch. He says, you know what? I'm actually going to use your own medicine against you, if you will. You guys value fancy speech and rhetoric and wisdom and power. Well, I'm going to use those very things against you. And I'm going to say what you guys look for in those, what you idolize and worship and value, I'm going to show that actually Jesus is every single one of those things and more. So let me read it over again with this in mind. I think some stuff will start to pop out to you. Verse 18. But to us who are being saved, it is... The power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? That just meant like Jewish theologian. So he calls them out. Now he's going to call out the Greeks. Where is the philosopher of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Paul, if you don't get the tone here, he's mocking them. He's sarcastic with them. He's like, I got you. Where are you at? Where where are your people at? You you guys can't measure up to this. What you guys thought was stupid and downright a contradiction is actually the very event that God's going to save the world with. And so he says, hey, you know, from the perspective of us Jesus followers, Verse 24, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Paul can talk trash. I, I like as I was studying this. I, I want to write a book like a theology of trash talking or something. Um, even sports that I suck at, like I go in there and I talk trash. I just love it. I think it's fun. I love getting underneath people's skin. That's exactly what Paul does here. You know, it's like those arguments that you hear from kindergartners out on the playground. Well, my dad's better than your dad. Well, my dad's bigger than your dad. Well, my dad can beat up your dad. I mean, that, that's like what Paul, it, you know, he's doing that here with them. A modern translator puts it this way. Human wisdom is so tiny, so helpless, next to the seeming absurdity of God. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's weakness. So, maybe you're here and you're like, okay, I get what Paul is saying, Mark. I get his argument. It makes sense. But, you know, actually now that you mention it, the cross kind of does seem like a little stupid. <laughs> like, explain to me how it really is the power and wisdom of God. I think Paul anticipates this. He expects them to ask this question. And so he says, okay, fine. You're asking for it. He's like, all right, I'm going to give you an illustration that Christ crucified actually is the power and wisdom of God. And he's like, it, it's going to hurt a little bit, though. It's going to be a little personal, but fine. You want it. He says this, verse 26, continuing on the second half of the passage. He's talking to them. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters, which is like, like a friendly introduction. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Um, you guys are a bunch of morons is kind of what he's saying. Not many were powerful. You guys are all weak. Not many were of noble birth, a.k.a. you're a bunch of nobodies. But whenever you see a but in Scripture, stop. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that don't even exist, to reduce to nothing things that are. Why? So that no one may boast before him. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, again, he makes this point twice. He said, this is the whole point that I'm saying this. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In simple, short, modern day language, you are the proof that Jesus and what he did on the cross is the most powerful and clever thing in the history of the world. You guys, be careful before you say amen, yeah. You guys were a bunch of nobodies. But now the cross says you're a somebody. And the church is proof of that. This is foolishness. Madness. Seriously, think about this. Where else in society is there a group of people, and I'm talking universally here as well as locally, that's as diverse culturally, racially, gender, age, music preference, fashion preference, economic standing that comes together every Sunday for a couple hours in unity? Where else in the world... Do people intentionally from different backgrounds gather together once a week to care for each other and have a meal together in a life group? See, a lot of people actually doubt Christianity and offer suspicion for it because they say, isn't it a bunch of different denominations with all these little differences? And I want to say, where else in the world do you have a group that comes together that's as different and diverse as the church? It's foolishness. 
Madness doesn't make sense. I know an older gentleman, unemployed for two years, should be, by all rights, depressed, full of anxiety, insecurity, madness. But he's actually full of joy, happiness, and security because of what Jesus did for him. Foolishness. Madness. What about the spouse who's cheated in their marriage and had an affair and has caused deep, deep hurt and mistrust, but the hurt spouse says, you know what, I want to pursue forgiveness. I want to work through this together. That's foolishness. That's stupid. But that's the gospel. It's offensive. But it's offensive for like every right reason. Tim Keller, he's a pastor in New York, he says this. He says, the gospel is this, and here's the offensive part. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. We're more messed up. We are more jacked up, as our series says, than we even know. But you are more loved than you can imagine. In Jesus. And so God, he is so wise and he is so powerful. And he says, I want to make this so crystal clear that I'm going to set up the good news of Jesus so that it's obvious who you should trust in. That's Paul's whole point here. I'll read it again. Starting at verse 27. I want it to be repetitive. But God chose what is foolish. In the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Things that aren't to reduce to nothing things that are. So that no one might boast in the presence of God. Says it again. Verse 31. In order that for the sole purpose. So that the one who boasts may they boast in the Lord. See, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the cross, actually what it does, it's like a giant spotlight and it will shine down on you and it will reveal to you who or what you boast in. The word boast, uh, it means, you know, to, to take pride in something, like to glory in. But it actually here comes real close to saying, what do you trust in? What do you Put your confidence in. And so we humans, it's impossible for us to not boast. You will put your trust and your confidence in something. That's what it kind of means to be human in a way. And we boast in whatever we risk everything to secure ourselves. That's what you'll boast in. Whatever you can do to secure yourself. And so I think there's two types of people here this morning. Two types of boasting, if you will. We have the non-religious people and we have the religious people, right? The exact same two groups that Paul dialogues with. We'll talk about the non-religious people first. Right back in that culture, it was fancy, again, it was all about status and image for wisdom, for philosophy, for talking fancy. Now, that has nothing to do with today. <laughs> Unless you go to Harvard or something, um, we don't always necessarily celebrate nerds anymore. Uh, I wish that was true. Uh, but same thing. We still celebrate status and image. Back then it was the philosophers. Today, guess who it is? Celebrities. Right? Athletes. Movie stars. The people who are the best in their field who have the most beauty, the most power, the most talent, the most fame, that's what we trust in. We go after that. Our culture says, pursue that. You want to experience life? 
yeah, more beauty, more power, more money, more fame. Let's talk about that. There's wisdom and there's status in that. And so, of course, Christianity, from that perspective, irrelevant, stupid, right? Why would you go follow a guy who says you must lose your life to gain your life? Like Jesus is a buzzkill. Where is he? I could have shared, I think, ten quotes here. There are so many stories of people who have beauty, money, and power, and everything else. Actually, and what do they all say? They say the same thing. It actually doesn't deliver like it says that it does. So here's one quote. David Letterman, right, used to host the, the late night show. I think we all probably know who he is. If there's anyone who can talk about acceptance and fame and human applause, I think it's David Letterman, right? He falls into that category. Here, here's what David Letterman says. He says, every night you're trying to prove your self-worth. It's like meeting your girlfriend's family for the first time. You want to be the absolute best, the wittiest, the smartest, the most charming, best-smelling version of yourself. If I can make people enjoy the experience and have a higher regard for me when I'm finished, it makes me feel like an entire person. If we've come short of that, I'm not happy. How things go for me every night is how I feel about myself for the next 24 hours. That's actually pretty sad to me. You're depending upon human applause and acceptance for your well-being every 24 hours? At least in my mind, that's foolish. Here's a little secret, though. Preachers do this all the time, too. Oh, let's use the most clever words, most compelling stories, most funny jokes, right, to get the applause of the people. I think it's preachers, actually, of all people who usually struggle with people-pleasing, saying the right thing, getting all the compliments. Here's the thing. You can get all the compliments you want. They'll never be enough. You always want more. I'm never satisfied. And then here's the worst part. When you do receive criticism and negative feedback, and you will, because we're all broken, we're not perfect, it'll shred you to pieces. But when I find my identity in Jesus alone and what he did for me on the cross, I no longer have to worry about what people think of me because I know what the God of the universe thinks of me. And then when you get to that point, that's actually when you can preach effectively and with freedom. Those are the sermons that God uses to change lives. When you lift up Jesus and say, he's the power, he's the wisdom of God. The cross, the powers of God is the status you've been looking for your whole life. Because the cross gives you the true status that money, power, and beauty can never give you. It sounds offensive. Sounds foolish. But it's actually the world's pursuit of money, power, and beauty that's foolish. Because it robs you of the life that you should have. The cross says you're no longer a nobody because Jesus has made you a somebody. We're almost done here. Religious person. Flip side of the coin. You're not off the hook. I think us religious people, I actually think we don't get the cross. Why? Well, we're a bunch of good people. We got our stuff together. We go to church every Sunday. I tithe. I'm a servant volunteer. I work at the food distribution. I got cross earrings. Right? According to moral standings, you're good to go. Here's the problem with a person like that. I actually think you'll probably get offended when someone walks in who doesn't have all their stuff together. Right? I think you know what I'm talking about. What if a homeless person came in here? What if we serve them communion just like we would anybody else? You gonna look at them weirdly? 
What if someone came in here full of tattoos, reeking of alcohol? What's your response to them? The church is and ought to be the place where our world calls nobodies are actually a somebody here because of what Jesus has done. And that's because the cross, it's the giant leveler. At the foot of the cross, it's equal. The cross says it's not what you do, but what God has done for you. So like the religious people, the Jewish people in this passage, God doesn't work the way that we expect him to work. He doesn't operate the way that we expect him to operate. That's actually a good thing. Religious or not, we all need the cross. And the cross is offensive because grace, if you really get it, grace is actually offensive. And if you think you deserve what Jesus did for you, right, that you're a somebody, you got something to bring to the table, you'll never realize your need for Jesus. Seriously. You get the cross when you don't get it. And so it reminds us, if we're religious people, just like it did for Corinth, we're actually a nobody. And I know that's not easy to say, and I put myself in that category. But you're a somebody in Jesus. Because in the cross, God looks at you, and he says, you are loved and accepted, and you can find complete security in Jesus. The cross is foolish. And it's a scandal. And so I'm going to invite the choir back up right now. Um, As always, we do every Sunday. We have so many response stations. um, And that's because we believe that you need to respond to what God is saying. Not what I'm saying, the gospel, what God is doing. And so we have communion right here. And it makes so much sense, I think, this morning to do communion. Communion. Right, to remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Your status comes from that. We have the prayer team back there. If you need prayer for anything, please. We have candles over here to light. But the cross is there is hope when it seems hopeless. And we're also going to have the offering here in a couple seconds, which, which is another way to respond. And so if you're new here or you've been here forever, if your heart's being led to respond, um, please, we would encourage you. So I just ask you, just take a a couple seconds, just prepare yourself. Ask God, what does he want to do in your life right now?